too. So I, I, I'm not so sure about the, um, the statement about me being well known in the Coral Centre. I try to keep a fairly low profile. Um, <laughs> So I, I just had two casual observations about Pete's um, talk there. Um, one, I really like that expression of, of the reef being both a cradle and a museum. That's, that's a really nice thought. And, and the second one was uh, the observation that um, he said something about the, the, the scale of, of um, GenBank's coverage of some of these organisms. Well, if you've got 60% of your fish uh, represented in some way in GenBank, that's, that's to me quite impressive because I remember the days when GenBank, uh, George Bush privatised GenBank for a while and um, it, <laughs> he tried to privatise GenBank. Um, it was, I subscribed and you got it on a single CD at that stage. So um, anyway, um, <laughs> I'll move on in the interest of time. Um, so I'd forgotten the title that I gave to my talk. Um, this is a kind of, um, I, I want to recognize uh, uh, Hua Ying, um, who's also known as Emily, um, a, a really outstanding Chinese um, postdoc uh, fellow at, at the ANU here, especially because um, this is based on a paper that we submitted six months ago. It's in revision to genome biology. Um, and it's got a long list of names, as you'll see. Um, but Emily really did 80% of the work. She's a remarkable young bioinformatician, a very smart young lady. Okay, how do I advance this? Is this going to go forward? Please help me somebody. <laughs> what do I do? Oh, is it this? Right, right. Oh, how primitive. All right. well, that doesn't work either. Um, that one? Yes, okay. Um, so, forgive me, I put this in uh, this morning um, in the interest of trying to justify the kind of thing that we do. So, um, I have to say, um, lab science in general, but genomics in particular, doesn't have a big presence um, in the Coral Centre. It's not a very visible uh, component. But I do want to say that, you know, genomics can teach you an awful lot. You can learn an awful lot of relevant stuff to management, to all kinds of things from genomes. And this, this paper, I think, is a, a kind of classic example. Um, the, the Crown of Thorns starfish was genome was sequenced last year. It's, a, it's an OS-driven uh, sequencing effort. Um, you know, I'm, I don't want to downplay the, the UQ connection here, um, but the sequencing was done at, at OS. Um, the maybe a lot of the intellectual contribution is from Australia. But, um, you know, the, the genome provides, and I've recently seen grant applications uh, about this, a way of, of potentially um, interfering with aggregation of crown of thorn starfish, um, which is a kind of, it suggests ways, no, completely novel ways, um, in which we might be able to control uh, crown of thorns outbreaks. So, believe me, genomics can tell you really useful stuff. Having said that, I'm not going to really tell you about really useful stuff. Um, this is the paper that we submitted recently, well, six months ago, um, to Genome Biology. Um, and as I told you, there's a long list of authors. It's got a very complex title, but I'll endeavour to make the take-home messages as simple as possible. So that's Emily on your right. Um, so, um, and I have to say, I'm using the term robust in a completely different sense to the way Sophie used robust. I'm using robust in the sense um, that it was one of the, it, it's the term which was used to describe one of the major lineages when this kind of cryptic um, deep divergence within corals was discovered. Um, so, Palumbi et al. Um, discovered that in using a a small bit of the mitochondrial genome, that there was a deep divergence. They can see a deep divergence within the corals, um, which on the basis of a limited number of species, they kind of made some link between these are more robust looking corals and these are more complex looking corals. That doesn't stand up anymore. But the divide does stand up. So most people that work on corals will recognise this deep divergence, which goes back at least to the, as far as the 
recognisable fossil record in the mid-Triassic, um, but we think it goes back much further. We think it goes back about 400 million years. Um, but the really kind of interesting thing is for us has been that, you know, you can see molecular support for this. It's a real division, um, but um, there's no kind of, there are very few biological correlates of this. So um, we we're hoping to shed some light on this by sequencing genomes. Um, so the, the, this divide is real, but its bases and significance are unknown. Um, and well, the data sets that existed prior to our um, paper really hadn't had not helped this situation because really genomics had focused to that point on complex corals. So most of the large molecular data sets were for, for complex corals. There wasn't much for robust corals at all. So we set out to address this by sequencing a few more genomes, um, in particular goniastria and fungia, a couple of robust corals, and an additional, what I think is a really interesting complex coral, galaxia. I have to acknowledge, and it's in, in light grey at the bottom there, that um, after we'd finished analyses and were writing the paper, the first robust coral <laughs> genome was published. And so as far as possible, we checked all our conclusions based on this new genome, but we didn't include it in all of our original analyses. It would have been just too much to go back to scratch. Okay, so um, first the obligatory uh, assembly and annotation statistics, which for most people are dreadfully boring. I'm only going to say, I've only included it really to, to make the point that um, our genome assemblies for these corals are, they're okay, they're not great, they're certainly not human genome or, or fish genome even, um, but they're pretty good genome assemblies. They're right up there with um, the uh, most of the other invertebrate genomes that have been published, including those for other uh, uh, cnidarians. Um, one, one, though, interesting observation that does stack up um, with larger numbers of, of genomes slowly becoming available is that um, if you look at the, the size of sizes of genomes, um, it seems that robust corals have typically have bigger genomes than complex corals. So not always, but usually it seems that the genomes of, of robust corals are significantly bigger. We've got some which are over a gigabase. Um, so still small by comparison with mammals, but um, large by comparison with Galaxia at 334. This increased genome size seems to be largely due to um, more, more um, transposons and, and junk DNA. There's, it's not that there are a lot more genes. Okay, so um, for our analyses, we included all of the, the, the whole genome data sets that we could get our hands on from uh, anthozoans. Um, so there are three new genomes, Goniastria, Fungi, and Galaxia. Um, the Acropora digitifera genome was made available in 2011. This is from OIST. Um, but we also had um, on the back boiler um, the, the long-awaited Acropora millipora genome sequence and the um, forthcoming Parites uh, uh, whole genome sequence too. So Emily has assembled all of these, um, except digitifera, I should say. Um, and we also included, uh, as a kind of close outgroup, uh, the two C anemone genomes that are available. That's Aptasia and, and Nematostella. All right. So what am I showing here? So this is syntony analysis. Um, and um, thank goodness, I thought Jenny was here to throw me out or <laughs> tell, me, <laughs> tell me to shut up or something. Um, <laughs> Okay, syntony analysis. It occurred to me this morning I maybe should explain what syntony analysis is. So syntony is, is simply um, common gene order. So it's, it's the looking at how genes are organized on chromosomes and comparing that. So a high level of syntony you see, for example, between chimpanzee and man. Um, what we didn't expect to see between complex and robust corals was a high level of syntony because the division is so deep, 
would expect genes to be essentially scrambled, and the take-home message from the left panel is that that's really not the case. So here are what you're looking at, I should explain. The three genomes, for each of the three new genomes, we've taken the five most synchronous scaffolds, scaffolds, large chunks of genome that we've assembled, and we've looked at, for, for regions where the genes in, for example, fungia are, are the, the regions which have a high level of syntony with regions in the other corals. So for each of the three species, the five biggest scaffolds, the most syntonous largest scaffolds, and we're showing connections to other genomes, the other genomes. And what I hope you can see is that there are a lot of connections between these two robust coral genomes and this complex coral genome. And it doesn't matter which complex coral genome you put in here, you get the same level of the red lines indicate where you can find syntony between a coral and the two other corals. So more red lines means higher levels of syntony, higher levels of conservation of gene order. So we hadn't expected to see this, but what you see within the corals is a high level of syntony between complex and robust lineages, despite maybe 400 million years of, of divergence. On the right, we've got the two um, sea anemone genomes and any coral genome. And what surprised us here was that not only are there few, relatively few connections between the sea anemones and Galaxia, but there's also relatively few connections between the two sea anemones. So the gray lines underlying the red lines indicate syntony between two of the three organisms. So there's a low level of syntony between sea anemones, two sea anemones, but there's a, a high level of syntony across the corals. Um, and there's not much syntony between corals and sea anemones either. Oh, so, sorry, I probably took about 10 minutes to explain that. Um, syntony 101. Okay. Um, next, next thing that uh, we did was to, to look at distribution of protein domains across um, these three lineages. That's complex corals, robust corals, and sea anemones. Um, and again, this is a fairly standard thing to do, and this kind of distribution isn't too surprising uh, in that most of these protein, the recognized protein domains are present in all three lineages. Some have some restrictions to uh, two or single lineages. So this is fairly kind of normal, fairly expected, but what wasn't expected was when we looked in detail at the list. So these are protein domains which are unique to robust corals. And the ones I've highlighted in red are protein domains that are uniquely associated with histidine biosynthesis. Why is that interesting? Well, animals aren't supposed to do histidine biosynthesis. Um, so it was a, a big surprise to us. Um, so histidine biosynthesis, histidine is an essential amino acid to all animals. We get it from our diet. We don't bother to synthesize something like nine of the 20 common amino acids. We get them from our diet. Um, the, the biosynthesis of histidine, it's a common pathway in plants, fungi, and bacteria, chemically constrained, energy consuming. Therefore, the ability to do it, why do it if you can get it from your diet? Well, all animals have lost the ability to do it except robust corals, it seems. There are 10 steps involved, but there's fewer enzymes involved. Some of these enzymes are, have got multiple catalytic uh, abilities. Um, so it turns out that uniquely amongst animals, robust corals have all seven genes, which enable them to uh, completely synthesize de novo histidine um, from scratch. Um, so the first thing you, I thought of when we saw this was, well, it's got to be contamination. Um, there are endosymbionts present in corals, as you know, symbiodinium. Um, symbiodinium makes histidine, so maybe it's contamination, but it isn't. So here's a phylogeny of the, 
the histidine biosynthesis genes. We've done this for several of the genes. This is just the first gene in the pathway, the energy consuming step. Um, here are the robust coral sequences, and here are the symbiodinium sequences. And most of these, three of these, are from the symbiont which is present in the corresponding robust coral. You can distinguish the two quite easily in phylogenetics. It isn't that these represent, these sequences in robust corals are not contamination. And we can also, I think, eliminate a lateral gene transfer uh, as a, a source of these genes. Um, and it's quite interesting to look at um, the the genomic context of these histidine biosynthesis genes, it looks quite clearly as if uh, in complex corals and sea anemones, these genes have been lost because we can find uh, syntonous regions, you know, same genes, same gene order across robust corals and complex corals. Um, and all that's missing is the histidine biosynthesis gene. So it's, it's much more easily explained, much more parsimonious to explain this as a gene loss um, than gene gain. Okay, so um, why retain the histidine biosynthesis pathway? Well, throughout the metazoa, histidine is an essential amino acid. You can get it heterotrophically. Um, but uh, if you've got symbionts, you could also potentially get it from your symbionts. And actually, transcriptomic data implies that that's what's going on in some cases. Well, it, therefore, um, it looks like uh, the, the robust corals have held on to histidine biosynthesis as a fallback strategy. And maybe sometimes it's a useful strategy. Maybe it also has implications for symbiont selection because you're going to not be so reliant on your symbionts to supply histidine if you can make it yourself. And in the interest of time, let's move on. I just want to tell you another story. So that, that's what I wanted to say about the complex robust uh, deep divide. I did want to mention also to this audience something which has nothing to do with that, that the divide, but which we learned from these genome sequences. And that's uh, something that concerns uh, stress tolerance. So of course, corals vary a lot in their stress tolerance. I like goniastria. Um, which Charlie says it frequently occurs in places where no coral might be expected to live. It's extremely stress tolerant. Um, and you know, in looking at the stress uh, response gene uh, complements of our various corals, it strikes me that there's a remarkable kind of correlation, apparent correlation between stress tolerance and numbers of HSP20 loci, one of the small uh, heat shock protein, small chaperones. Um, there are a lot more loci in the stress-tolerant uh, anthozoans than there are in uh, uh, stress-sensitive corals. This, oh, okay, small sample size, but I'd like to see this explored a bit more thoroughly. And that's really it. Take-home messages. We were surprised that synteny, the, the level of synteny, despite the depth of the divergence, um, we found that robust corals can make uh, their own histidine, and um, we think it's got some strong implications for symbiont selection. Um, and there's this interesting apparent correlation between stress tolerance and numbers of HSP20 loci, which I'd like, well, we are going to take further. And um, I should say this was funded largely, the sequencing was funded largely by, by, by Platforms Australia, um, through some of which was through the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, large number of people involved at, at both the ANU and JCU. Um, and with that, I'm being thrown off stage, I think. Thank you. Uh, thank you.